And as you are seated, if you would turn with me either in the order of service to page 11 or in the Pew Bible to page 981 and to the passage that Dr. Larter has read for us this evening, it will be helpful to us, I think, to have that portion of Scripture open before us. And as you turn there uh, on this celebration of the 450th anniversary of the Scottish Reformation, uh, a joy for those of us who know and love Scotland and who love the tunes of the Psalms uh, that we know by heart. Uh, most of us in Scotland can't read music and so our hymn books don't have music but we know the words of the Psalms and we know the tunes from time immemorial and it would be difficult I think for you to have a sense of how deeply our worship this evening touches something in a Scotsman and I want to thank my friend Dr. Paul Jones for all his labours in preparing for our service this evening. 450 years. The work of God in 1560 in the writing of the Scots Confession. But like so many of the works of God, the work of God often begins before it becomes publicly noticeable. And exactly the same was true of the Scottish Reformation. It was, in a very special way, not only a Reformation, it was a season of extraordinary spiritual revival. And as is often the case, spiritual revival has deep roots. When John Knox, who spent about ten years compiling a history of the origins of the Reformation, tried to explain what it was exactly that had happened, he put it like this, God gave his Holy Spirit to ordinary men in extraordinary measure. And what he wanted to emphasize was that the work of Reformation was not merely an external clearing away of religious rubble, but was a work of God in which men and women and boys and girls were wonderfully and in extraordinary numbers brought to a living faith in the Saviour, Jesus Christ. Another way in which these Scottish reformers liked to understand what God had done in those days was that by his spirit, in his word, they had rediscovered the gospel of the Apostle Paul. And they understood that in so many important ways, the gospel had actually reached Scotland, indeed reached so many parts of Europe, because God had humbled and subdued and converted Saul of Tarsus. And so as they rediscovered the gospel of Paul, they were not surprised also to discover that the ways of Jesus Christ with Saul of Tarsus had been reduplicated in some of those who were so significant in bringing the gospel again to Scotland 450 years ago. When John Knox actually traces the deep origins of the Reformation at the beginning of those years, he draws special attention to a young man by the name of Patrick Hamilton. Patrick Hamilton lived for 24 years, but John Knox believed that it was through what God had done in that young man's life that he had begun a work that was irreversible in the 16th century in the gospel coming to an entire nation. And we read from Philippians chapter 3 this evening because there are actually so many parallels in the life of Patrick Hamilton, that early Scottish reformer, and the life of Saul of Tarsus. And the reformers, as I say, recognized that although there are different individuals in different times, there are often these same footprints of God's grace 
working in the lives of those that he signally used. What I want us to think about for a little while this evening is those parallel lines of God's work of saving grace and transforming power in two individuals so far apart in history but brought so close together by the working of God's Holy Spirit. And in some ways, in their respective societies, so similar to one another. In Philippians chapter 3, as we've already seen in our reading, the Apostle Paul describes what he was by nature. And he tells us in Philippians 3, 3 and 4, that he was a young man with an impeccable pedigree. He lists the details of that. He was a true Jew circumcised on the eighth day. He didn't belong to half-caste Jewry, being born a Jew but uh, being born as a Greek speaker rather than a Hebrew speaker. He was a Hebrew speaker of Hebrew-speaking parents. He was committed to the strict way of the Pharisees. And he tells us that as far as righteousness according to the law was concerned, he was absolutely blameless. There was, in fact, he tells us in his letters, there was no one with the kind of pedigree that Saul of Tarsus had. The same could have been said in the early years of the 16th century about Patrick Hamilton. He was descended from King James II. He belonged to the most significant family, perhaps, in all Scottish history. If you look at the great volumes of the Dictionary of National Biography for the United Kingdom, you will find about a hundred pages of Hamilton's, the single most distinguished family outside of the royal family in all of Scottish history until this point. A man with an extraordinary brilliance of education, a little like Saul of Tarsus. And a man who had studied as Saul of Tarsus tells us he had done under the great scholars of his day, in the case of Saul of Tarsus, the great Gamaliel, in the case of Patrick Hamilton, the best scholars of Scotland and the finest scholars of Europe. All of that he had by nature, this glorious pedigree. And yet, like Saul of Tarsus, Christ brought him to a day where he was able to say, all of these things I count as rubbish by comparison with the excellence of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. So there were men who shared a marvelous pedigree by nature. They were also men who discovered deep sinfulness in their hearts. That may seem to be a surprising thing to say about Saul of Tarsus because he says in this passage that as to the law, he was blameless. That was his perception on his past life. No blame, no special accountability to God, no sense of inferiority with others who sought to be obedient to God's commandments. Actually, the gospel writers tell us that Paul had a predecessor in that, a young man who came to Jesus to ask him what he had to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him to keep the commandments. And he said, as Saul said about himself, all of these commandments, sir, I have kept from my youth upwards. And just like that young man, apparently the Lord Christ used the same word of God in Saul of Tarsus's life as he had used in the life of that young man. Jesus said, you remember, to that young man, then if this is the case, it will be no difficulty for you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me if you are blameless according to the law. And the young man discovered that he coveted his riches. His hands were sticky 
with glue upon them, and he could not let them go. And so he went away sorrowful because the commandment, you shall not covet, had been used by the Savior to expose his sin. And fascinatingly, the Apostle Paul tells us, doesn't he, in Romans chapter 7, as he looks back on his life, he says, Once I felt myself to be alive, but then the law came, and sin revived, and I died. And he goes on to explain exactly what he means by saying, when the law came, he says, so interestingly, the law said, you shall not covet. And I discovered that there was covetousness in my heart and sin revived and I died and saw my need of God's saving grace. I think the New Testament gives us little hints as to how that happened in the life of Saul of Tarsus. Do you remember how he says at the beginning of his letter to the Galatians that he outstripped all of his generation in religious zeal. There was no one to match him. But then in an interesting way, before Saul of Tarsus actually appears on the scene in the New Testament Scriptures, in the fifth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, another young man appears. His name is Stephen. And we're told that he was full of grace and power and did wonders and signs. And then we are told this. This is, I think, one of the great clues to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Listen to this. Some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Now those little details are very striking, aren't they? Why should Luke include those details? My friends, it was because Saul of Tarsus probably belonged to the synagogue to which those from Tarsus in Cilicia regularly went. And that clue is opened up in the verses that follow as we discover that Saul was actually among those who accused Stephen and then finally stoned Stephen to death. He was the chief witness there. He approved of his death. And then in a rage he went off to persecute the church. Why did he do that? Answer, perhaps, you may think, because he was a Pharisee. And that's the kind of thing Pharisees didn't. But Pharisees didn't customarily do that. The man who had been Saul of Tarsus's respected professor, Gamaliel, had said, let's not persecute them. Let's see if this is from God, and if it's from God, it will succeed, and if it's from man, it will fall to the ground. It wasn't because Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee that he was enraged. I think these clues are embedded in the Acts of the Apostles, because they explain why Paul later says of himself in Romans chapter 7, the law said you shall not covet. And for the first time in his life, this young man who had been able to say that he stood head and shoulders above all of his generation religiously found himself shrinking in the presence of a young man whose graces and gifts and understanding of the Scripture and even the grace and glory that shone through his face because sometimes his face looked as though it was the face of an angel. And I rather suspect, although I'm not sure it can be demonstrated, that that was the instrument that caused such rage against Christ in Saul of Tarsus. Many of us here in this room have seen that and wondered why it is that some are so angry against us and against the Lord Jesus who did them no harm. 
And the answer, of course, is because they're being convicted of their sin and of their need. And in a similar way, we find this dear young man, Patrick Hamilton, at one point in his life, describing something of his own experience as God began to speak to him. And he puts it like this. The law of God said, pay your debt. And then I discovered that the gospel says, Christ has paid it all. The law says you are a sinner, despair of yourself. You will be damned, but the gospel says your sins may be forgiven. Be of good comfort, you will be saved. The law says make amends for your sins. That's the first thing the awakened sinner tries to do. I'll make amends for my sins. The gospel says Christ has made amends for your sins. The law says the Father in heaven is angry with you. The gospel says Christ has pacified him with his blood. The law says what is your righteousness, goodness, and satisfaction? The gospel says Christ will be your righteousness, goodness, and satisfaction. The law says you are bound to oblige me. But the gospel says Christ has delivered me. And so, wrote Patrick Hamilton, the law was silenced and the gospel prevailed. And this helpless prisoner saw the great iron gate opened in front of him by a nail-pierced hand. And then there's a third thing Paul speaks about here that certainly was true of Patrick Hamilton. Great pedigree by nature. Discovered sin in his heart. And then came by faith to find all the riches of God's grace poured out upon him in Jesus Christ. And so says the Apostle Paul, I want to be found in Christ not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that righteousness before God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And Patrick Hamilton similarly, as a youngster, scarcely out of his teenage years, giving himself in faith to Jesus Christ when few around him were doing so, his family anxious and alarmed at what has happened to this young man in danger of being disinherited as the Apostle Paul seems to suggest in this chapter he actually was disinherited losing all things for the sake and cause of Jesus Christ because he discovered something in Jesus Christ that made Jesus Christ more precious to him than all the world he discovered, as he says here, this simple formula and equation that Christ minus everything is still everything. And everything minus Christ is at the end of the day absolutely nothing. And so, by God's grace, found himself in Jesus Christ. Patrick Hamilton really did count Jesus Christ worthy of the loss of everything. And so in his early 20s he was brought to trial before five bishops of the Roman Church. The scene must have been like something out of Vanity Fair. Here was this young man whose wife had recently conceived their first child. He is 24 years old. And on the bench sit these bishops of the Scottish Church. James Beaton, known as the Carnal Cardinal, with 11 illegitimate children. John Rowell, with four illegitimate children, described as the greatest defouler of wives and maidens in Scotland. George Jury, with five illegitimate children. John Hepburn, with four illegitimate children. Patrick Hepburn, with 15 illegitimate children. And in this vanity fair of a trial, as this young man counts everything but loss, for the sake of the surpassing excellency of knowing Jesus Christ as 
Lord, these wretches condemn him to death and are so afraid of the influence of this young man that they order his death quickly. Some of you in the room tonight have been to that very spot in St. Andrews where the letters PH are carved in stone. Where Patrick Hamilton was martyred for the cause of our Savior Jesus Christ. Because all he wanted to know, as Paul says here, was Jesus Christ in the power of his resurrection, even if it means sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings and being made like him in his death because of the assurance that one day he would attain to the resurrection from the dead. And it was this that gripped John Knox as he thought about Patrick Hamilton. It was this that gripped the Apostle Paul as he thought about the martyr Stephen. Where do you think the Apostle Paul learned such lessons about the Christian life as those he describes, for example, in 2 Corinthians 4, when he says, we are always carrying around in our body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be manifested in our bodies Death works in us, he says, so that life may work in others. Where did he learn that? He was a living testimony to that, wasn't he? It was as death for the sake of Jesus Christ had worked in young Stephen that God, through that ministry, was working new spiritual life into Saul of Tarsus. And it was as death worked its work in young Patrick Hamilton that life began to work in many others in the land of Scotland. Choosing Jesus Christ, even though in this world it meant the loss of all things, including wife and child. There are, I think, few more moving passages in Scottish literature than John Knox's description of the scene. At the place of execution, Master Patrick gave to his servant, who had been chamber child to him of a long time, his gown, his coat, his bonnet, and such like garments, saying, These will not profit in the fire. They will profit thee. After this of me thou canst receive no commodity except the example of my death, which I pray thee bear in mind, albeit it be bitter to the flesh and fearful before men, yet it is the entrance into eternal life which none shall possess that deny Jesus Christ before this generation. The innocent servant of God being bound to the stake in the midst of some coals, some timber, and other matter appointed for the fire. A train of powder was made and set on fire, which neither kindled the wood nor yet the coals, and so remained the appointed to death in torment till men ran to the castle again for more powder and more wood, able to make fire, which at last being kindled, with loud voice he cried, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. How long shall darkness overwhelm this realm? How long wilt thou suffer this tyranny of men? The fire was slow, and therefore was his torment the more. But most of all he was grieved by certain wicked men who continually cried, Convert, heretic! Call upon Our Lady! Say, Salve, Regina! Save us, O Queen! To whom he answered, Depart, and trouble me not. And because the wind that blew off the sea blew the smell of Hamilton's flesh into the land, one said that the smell of Master Patrick Hamilton infected all those upon whom it blew. Death worked 
in him and life worked in others. May I draw just a few lessons this evening as I come to a close. The first is this. But the work of God never depends on methods, but on men and women. It is not new methods we need in the work of the gospel, but men and women who will give their all for the sake of Jesus Christ. Lesson number two. There are many who do great work. But all who do great work are always dependent on those who have done work before them. When you think through the history of the Christian church, if there is one great lesson, it is this. That as you list all the men and women who have been most prominent in the work of the gospel throughout 2,000 years of church history, and from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, one of the most significant things you will notice is that you know their names, but you do not know the names of those who were chief influences on their lives. And Patrick Hamilton, whose name some of us in the room may never have known, was a man God used in this way. And through his ministry, his testimony to Christ, many were brought to faith and stood for him. The third lesson we learn, and it's a vital lesson for our times, because we now have something of a tendency to say it's becoming a little difficult to be a Christian in the 21st century. God uses those disciples who are most willing to carry Jesus' cross and count everything but loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. And the final lesson is this. The single most important thing in all the world is to know the glory of Jesus Christ and to be able to speak about his surpassing excellence and to call him Lord. These, at the end of the day, are the great lessons of the Scottish Reformation. That if Jesus Christ is worth living for, he is worth dying for. And if he's worth dying for, he is most worthy of living for. And so as we celebrate those events of so long ago, let their message penetrate us in the year 2010 that we may be such men and women trusting in Jesus Christ for our righteousness, given to Jesus Christ for our lives, willing to lose all for Jesus Christ, for the lives of others. May it be so. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonders of your work in church history. Not least this evening do we thank you that we belong to the same family as Patrick Hamilton and John Knox and others who went before, that they are our brothers in Jesus Christ and we are their sisters and brothers. We pray as through your Holy Spirit and by your word you create in us the same family likeness, the same likeness to our dear elder brother, the Lord Jesus, that we, like them, may share the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings and share the fellowship of Jesus' triumph, and that through our lives, in days of ease and days of pressure, the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace and glory may be seen in us, that others may be brought as so many were brought through Patrick Hamilton, to come and trust in him. As the atmosphere of his death in St. Andrews spread to others, we pray that the atmosphere of our lives individually and together as church families may spread throughout this city to the ends of the earth for the glory of God. 
and the fame of our great Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.